Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today on the first instalment of Hydrogen's Tech Talks. Um, joining me today is Dan McNeil, who is an engineering director who works over at Comply Advantage. Um, the topic of the discussion today is so why your mental health is not taboo. Um, so something that uh, you know people may feel they're not comfortable speaking about it in the workplace. So that's what the discussion is uh, is going to follow. Passing over to you, Dan. Dan, please introduce yourself. What it is you do at Comply Advantage and how you would best define mental health. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for having me. So um, I have worked at Comply Advantage all of this year. So started the in January. I manage um, a group of squads based across our London and Romanian offices, um, developing the kind of business logic and front end of the, the software that people use to access our data. Uh, what we do as a company is we, we fight financial crime. It sounds like a big thing. It, it is a big thing. So we provide um, anti-money laundering software. We provide software for checking against sanctions lists and against adverse media and um, politically exposed persons. We are building a a system that will allow people to have a one-stop shop for looking at um, financial risk. Um, so that's what we do. Within that, I, I say I've been there nine months. Um, at Comply, we take the people very seriously. You know, the people come first, and and part of everybody is their mental health. You know, for me, mental health isn't something that only people who are struggling have. Everybody has it, whether it's um, good one day or whether it's bad the next. We all have mental health the whole time, in exactly the same way we have physical health. Mental health for me is the is the well-being around your feelings, your emotions. And your ability to think and operate mentally. So in the same way, physical health is how is my body working physically and can I move around and can I do the things I need to do? Mental health is how is my mind working and can I think the things I need to think, feel the things I need to feel and do the things I need to do? Um, the one thing that for me is key is that physical health and mental health are not separate um physical health can influence mental health and very often does if you look at people who suffer physical trauma actually the mental health aspect is definitely on the road to recovery for them um and the other way around actually mental health can cause physical symptoms if you look at people who suffer from anxiety you might have an anxiety attack for instance that will definitely manifest itself as physical symptoms so whilst it's analogous to physical health they're not not completely separate. Yeah, yeah, it's something. Yeah, it's something I completely, you know, completely agree with as well. Um, it's you know something that can be difficult to determine and, and sort of understand. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely something I'd agree with. Um, so today, so we've got three points that we're going to speak around. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into it. Um, how do you ensure that you know yourself and your team um, have a comfortable and a safe environment to speak about their mental health? I mean, I know it can be more difficult working from home. So, so, so what is it you do to ensure the team has that safe space? I think you need to fundamentals. Um, so the fundamentals need to be, as an organisation, you need to recognise that mental health exists and that everybody has it and that issues that affect people's mental health are as real as issues that affect people's physical health. So, for instance, the sickness policy for a company should include mental health conditions. You know, the company policy should be that if somebody can't work for a day because their mental health doesn't allow them to, that's as valid a reason for them to take a day off sick as if they've got a cold or, you know, got a migraine. It's it, it should be on the same footing. I think whilst that's important as the fundamentals, I think it's important not to stop there, though. That that puts the basis in place to build upon. But I think what you need to do is you need to, to live that as a leader as well. You need to ensure that you make it clear to people that if they have issues with mental health, which impact their work, that they can share them and they will be taken seriously um i think you need to be part of that yourself though and i guess 
we can talk separately about um, mental health of leaders, but I think being allowing yourself to open up, allowing yourself to talk about your mental health will encourage other people to do the same. Um, and I'm not suggesting that ev you know everybody talks about everything they're feeling to everyone else. I know some organisations do that, but what I'm suggesting is that we we share when we're feeling anxious, we share when we're feeling nervous, we share when we're feeling happy, we share when we're feeling disappointed. I think that there can be, I've worked in some places where there is, is an assumption that in order to be effective as an engineer and effective as a leader, emotions shouldn't feature in your decision making. They should, you shouldn't feel things that will things. And actually, I think that is, is a falsehood. People do feel things. And, and no matter how much you might say to people, don't act on your emotions when making a decision, they will, because we all feel things. We all feel happy about some things, sad about other things, anxious about some things and excited about others. We feel all the time because we're all human. And so I think giving the space for people to express that will hopefully start the conversation of the allowing to express maybe more serious or more important to them concerns. I think that um, as a manager, you need to remember that you're dealing with people, whatever's happening, whether you're giving somebody a 50% pay rise or whether you're telling somebody they're being made redundant. In both of those situations, you're dealing with a person and that person has feelings, that person has emotions. And I think you need to create the space to allow those person that person to express those emotions, whatever they are. Um, you know, I, I get my um, inspiration from the weirdest of places, but when Peter Capaldi was leaving the role of Doctor Who, and he made a great speech just before he turned into Jodie Whittaker. And one of the things he said was always try to be nice and never fail to be kind. And I think that there is a there is a human kind way to do even the most unpleasant things, which will create the space for people to come and talk to you. And, you know, I encourage feedback. I encourage people if I make a decision or say something in the meeting that somebody doesn't like, I encourage people to come to me and say, here is how I felt about that. Not not here is a piece of evidence that means you were wrong or here is a piece of evidence that means you're right. But. I felt happy that you said that. I felt disappointed that you said that. I think provide some level of emotional commentary is is important. And I think as leaders, we have to do that as well. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because it's something that's not tangible. You have to speak about it and then and then, you know, it can sort of become the norm. Um, I mean, especially in current times, would you say it's been more difficult doing this while working from home? Um, or, or do you think you know it? You know it, it should stay the same. It's, it's not something that should be a blocker. Um, you know, is there anything any difficulties that you face basically? I think that w the thing I've seen whilst we've all been, most of us have been working from home. You know, obviously frontline workers and people aren't, but most of us in the tech industry have been working from home, and I've seen the nature of video calls change. I think when video calls were something you didn't do that often people would have a habit of saying, oh, I won't discuss that on a video call, I'll discuss that face to face. So if you had a team member that was at home one day a week, for instance, you might see meetings being pushed off till tomorrow because it's easier to have that discussion face to face. And, um, you know, performance reviews, for instance, it, before lockdown, I would not have somebody's performance review on a day when they were working. I would have said that's a situation we need to have face to face. Even if it was a really good performance review, it feels like a face to face conversation. I think what's happened throughout lockdown is video calls for most people have become more normalized. I mean, we've just been through our quarterly performance review cycle at work and we've had to do that remotely. That there hasn't really been an option. I think it's still it's still difficult to have. Difficult conversations with people remotely much more so than it is face to face yeah. um the it's much easier when you're in a room with somebody to open up 
and to say how you're feeling, um, to talk about if something's making you happy or indeed if you're having issues that mean that um, you can't work. You know, during lockdown, it's affected different people in different ways. And some people have really been struggling with their mental health during lockdown. And I think it's been important for us to recognise that and, you know, to come back to what I said at the beginning, that's as valid a reason for not being able to work as having a physical injury. Yeah. And so I think providing that space for people, slowly coming to terms with the fact that, yes, video calls sometimes break up and sometimes the sound isn't great, but actually you can still get your meaning across. You can still build a meaningful relationship with someone. What's been interesting for us is even though I... I started at Comply in January, so I spent two and a half months in the office and pretty much we've been out of the office since March. When the regulations have allowed, our office has opened up for some time here and there for people who want to go in. And I have spent a couple of days in, but largely it's been remote. Um, I've actually built most of my work, meaningful working relationships remotely because in the first two and a half months, you're kind of finding the lie of the land. You're kind of finding out who does what and which teams do what and who talks to whom and who do you need to talk to about this kind of stuff. And so it's been very interesting for me because most of my relationships have been built remotely. And actually, I think I've built some very solid working relationships remotely, which gives me hope that it can be done. And I think it comes back to people will mirror each other a lot in conversations not just you know in the stuff you read about about mirroring body language to build rapport and all that but they will mirror each other in how open they are and in their tone and so i think if i go into meetings i'm having with people remotely as if it were a face-to-face -face conversation acknowledge the fact it's remote so this is a bit weird but say look this is what we've got if i go in and i'm open and sometimes vulnerable and talk about how I'm feeling in those conversations, then people will come the other way because they will see it's safe. Um, you know, people are by nature animals at the fundamental level. And if you look at, um, you know, we keep guinea pigs. And if you look at them, they if one of them is doing something, the others will see it's safe to do it and follow. And I'm not saying people are like guinea pigs, but in some ways we are if you see somebody else doing something you're more likely to do it yourself because you understand it's safe yeah yeah completely i suppose um you know things sort of trickle down from the top so being a leader yourself if you can if you can sort of uh, you know push that onto the team then it should sort of trickle down throughout the company so um yeah no, that's, that's some really interesting points um yeah thank you for that Leaders aren't bulletproof. So this is another point that we wanted to talk about. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a misconception. Being a leader, you have to be bulletproof and you can't sort of show any vulnerabilities. Um, so we thought it'd be an interesting, an interest, an interesting topic. Um, so Dan, from your side, so how do you ensure uh, you know, the mental health of uh, you know, yourself within an organisation being a leader? Um, you know, have you ever had a situation where your mental health has been affected? Um, and you know, so what is it you do? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is a very interesting point for me. If we look at um, the traditional image of a leader, a traditional image of, an, of a leader is not somebody who cries. The traditional image of a leader is not somebody who says, I'm afraid. Now, fortunately, that's changing. But I think in the workplace, there is still this perception that leaders, the more senior they are, they kind of turn off their feelings, they turn off their emotions. And I think, as you know, as with anybody, it's not true, they still feel them. They still get nervous, they still get afraid, they still get worried, they still have good days and bad days. I think that for me personally, I have struggled with mental health issues for most of my life. And it's not, you know, it's something I talk about openly, I talk about on LinkedIn, I don't share all the details because I'm not comfortable doing that. But I'm, you know, I'm happy to say that I do suffer with mental health issues. And for a long time, I felt that that would prevent me having a successful career as a leader. And actually, there have been a couple of people who 
have inspired me to know that's not true. Um, and I won't embarrass them by name checking them, but I still remember the first manager who, when I was, my mental health wasn't particularly great, who actually said to me, you know, if your mental health's not great, you can take a day off. And that was the first time somebody, that's the first time I'd heard somebody say, actually, mental health is a valid reason for taking a day off. Um, and I remember an, another person who, again, I won't name, who occupied a very, very senior position in a, in a company that, that I was working for. And there was a change happening. And um, he grabbed me for a quick chat because the change impacted me to say, how are you feeling? And I said, well, I'm kind of not happy. You know, it, it upsets me a bit, this change. It's kind of disappointing. Things didn't work out as they were going to. And he actually said to me, yeah, I'm disappointed as well. You know, I'm sad that it didn't work out the way it was going to. And actually that made me think of him as a stronger leader not a weaker leader because he's 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 comfortable enough in himself to express emotions that you wouldn't normally get from a leader i think that it's important for all of us to recognize that everybody has mental health and everybody's mental health is sometimes good and sometimes bad and that's true of everybody and if somebody does have an issue with their mental health which goes on over time that doesn't preclude them from being successful it doesn't preclude them from doing a good job at work you know in in exactly in the same way that if somebody had a physical health condition you'd make the necessary adjustments to their workspace in order to accommodate that to allow them to do the job they need to do and exactly the same is true of of mental health and indeed other types of neurodiversity you might need to make adjustments to how the job is done the physical environments the but it doesn't prevent that person from being able to to do the job and i guess i've been lucky in that i've been surrounded by people some very inspirational people who've taught me that actually struggling with mental health is, is not a barrier to success and nor should it be. Um, so I think for me as a leader, I kind of have a responsibility to carry that message on. You know, I'm in a much more senior position than I was when that first manager said to me that day. And I think I now have to kind of carry that with me and make sure that the managers I now manage know that it's OK for them not to feel great. It's OK for them not to be OK about something. It's OK for them to need some emotional support to get them through a change that they might be finding difficult. You know, the days of saying you're a manager, deal with it, are thankfully long gone. Um, I think from a leadership point of view, we do have a second responsibility, though. And I always describe this as my two hats of leadership. We have a responsibility for the people and the well-being of the people. We also have a responsibility to the business and we have to balance both of them. So. If I am very anxious about something that's happening financially with a company I used to work for or whatever, or there's something happening which is, you know, gnawing away at me because I'm very anxious about it, I would not necessarily share the depth of that anxiety with the team because it has the potential to, to spread the anxiety to other people that weren't feeling it. So I think as a leader, you do have a responsibility to mind your messaging be careful what you say to whom and that you don't stimulate others to to start feeling anxious about something or start feeling sad about something but i think there is a line that can be walked where you're still open about your feelings but without creating you know the spread of negativity or the spread of anxiety around a team yeah yeah no for sure for sure and i think i mean you did you did sort of briefly touch on it during that as well but from from a you know, from a leader's perspective, like yourself, what would your advice be to other leaders to maintain a healthy state of mind if there's something that they're struggling to do, something they you know maybe are not comfortable speaking about? What would your advice be to those people? My advice would be: remember you're human, as other people are. Remember that if you're a, a good leader, and you know I'm very fortunate in that I've been a tech leader for a while but i'm still in a position where i'm learning new things almost every day i'm doing something for the first time 
And it's important to remember that. It's important to remember that you don't know all the answers. It's okay not to know stuff. It's okay to be anxious about something. It's okay to be concerned about something. Um, and I would say find some people to trust who are in appropriate positions that you can talk to when you need to. And this comes back to what I was saying about, you know, you shouldn't necessarily show the depth of these feelings with the team, but somebody who is in a similarly senior management position or somebody who is in HR or somebody who is in a position where you being open about having a bad day is contained in a way that's not going to negatively impact the team. Find those people and be open with them. You know, we all in life, as much in professional life as in personal life, we need people around us we we can trust that we can confide in and that will trust and confide in us you know we we are animals who thrive on interaction and i've been very fortunate that in my current role and in most previous roles i've worked with some brilliant people who i've had that relationship with and they're not even necessarily people i work directly with day to day but you just find the kind of the like-minded souls who you get on with who you can trust and it's absolutely okay to the right audience to say yes i'm a leader but today i'm not feeling great so i'm not going to be at my best today yeah yeah definitely yes yes it's, it's some really interesting points you raise and yeah thank you for sharing uh, you know some personal information and details about yourself i think this is another really interesting point to speak about because I don't think it's spoken about enough or maybe even recognised um, in the industry. So obviously, um, you know, yourself, Dan, you interview people often. So from, you know, from your perspective, is it something that's recognised? Is it something that people are even aware of that the mental health throughout a hiring process? I don't think it is as much as it should be. I think that the hiring process is... Um, you know, one thing that I've learned struggling with anxiety throughout the years is that sometimes anxiety is a natural feeling. You know, for me, anxiety is an issue with mental health is where the anxiety is not in its normal places or is more controlling than it should be. So actually, you know, if you're about to go on stage and sing to 100,000 people, a few butterflies in the stomach are probably good. And the same is true of a job interview. Job interviews are one of the the rare situation, sorry, the rare situations in life where you're explicitly being judged. You're explicitly saying to somebody, am I good enough? And they're saying yes or no to you. And for most people, that is going to expose some lack of confidence. That is going to expose some anxiety. That's going to be, you know, people feel butterflies in the stomach before a job interview, and that's good. Um, but I'm not sure that we always account for that in the process. You know, so somebody comes in and, you know, I've had people come in for interview who've been so nervous that for the first 20 minutes they've been literally shaking so much they couldn't pick up a glass of water. And I think it would be easy to write them off. It would be easy to go, oh, well, you know, what would happen when they're in a stressful situation in the office? And the answer is, well, they wouldn't be in this stressful a situation in the office. This is an artificially anxious situation because they're explicitly being judged. So for me, I think we need to, to understand that this is a, a tough time for all candidates and for any candidates who do suffer from lack of confidence, whether they suffer from anxiety, whether they suffer from any other myriad kinds of neurodiversity, this might be worse for them. And so, you know, advice I would give is check in with candidates check is there anything more they need to know check are there any accommodations that we need to make for them you know I, we wouldn't think anything in this day and age of when we invite somebody for in for interview we'd say do you have any accessibility requirements because you know if you're a wheelchair user we'll put the interview in a meeting room that's easier for you to get to you know there's, there's stuff like that that we fortunately now think of we should also make it clear to candidates that if they've got any other things that are going to make the interview less stressful for them that we can reasonably do then tell us and we'll do them um you know 
one thing, for instance, is I once had a candidate who suffered with anxiety and was open about that during the process and said, look, what would really help would be if I could get into the interview room early and calm down in that room so that when the interview started, I wasn't in a strange environment where I didn't know who was coming into the room or whatever. And that the cost to us to accommodate that is trivial. And the cost of not accommodating it is you might lose the best developer you've ever hired. Um, I would say that there, there are things you can do. So avoiding surprises, make the interview process transparent from day one. Tell people what's going to happen. Tell people when they're going to hear back, even if they're not going to hear back for longer than you would normally anticipate because somebody's on holiday or something else going on. Be open with them about it. And those people that are susceptible to becoming anxious will be calmed down. And those people that aren't, well, they've got extra information. It doesn't hurt them to have that extra information. Um, it is it is disappointing the way I still see some interviews conducted. Fortunately, not not to comply. We we, we do consider this in in the interview process. You know, just before recording this, I've come out of a meeting on pretty much exactly this topic about how can we make our interview process better for the candidates. But there was, you know, interviews used to be almost a combat sport. You'd get the candidate in and you'd try to outwit them. And if they successfully won the battle of which you'd hire them. And I'd like to think we've moved away from that, but evidence suggests that we haven't everywhere. So I, I don't think it is. I still think we consider toughness to be a virtue. And actually, I'm not sure that toughness is a virtue. I think ability to do the job is a virtue. And you don't have to be tough mentally in order to do a job. Yeah, yeah, and no, I completely. I think it's um, it's something that a lot of people probably wouldn't recognise. I thought it was quite interesting about how you said about candidates that have come into the room early just so they can, you know, get themselves set up. I think, especially working from home as well and, and doing these interviews over video chats, some people may feel a bit uncomfortable. You know, there might be even I'm sure on what to wear, like, you know, if you're working with the job, chances are you're not going to, you know, dress smart every day, but how should you conduct yourself in a video interview? How can you make sure there's no distractions if you've got pets or young children? It's a lot of things that can sort of build up and, and you know, definitely negatively affect people's mental health. Yeah, and I think, again, it's about being open about that. There is no harm in telling candidates before the video interview just wear what you're comfortable in. Because some people would say, I was going to do that anyway. And the people who were dusting off their suit would say, oh, good, I don't need to dust off the suit. Um, and the same with, with kids and pets, you know, especially during lockdown, especially during the part when schools were all closed. People have got kids running around at home. It's, it's, not, it's not either a positive or a negative. It's just a fact. And so if somebody's kid interrupts the interview to say, mummy, who's that on the screen halfway through? It doesn't make any material difference to the interview, but I think it's important to reflect to the candidate that it doesn't make any difference. It's important to say to the candidate, that's fine. You know, just so that it, it doesn't enter their mind as, as something they're worried about. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Again, it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting point to raise. I feel like this has probably happened to a lot of people, um, you know, even in the last few months. So, yeah, thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. So that concludes our discussion today. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed the video. Um, obviously, a special thanks to Dan for sharing his thoughts. Um, and I hope people can take something away from this. So thank you very much for your time, Dan. It's been great speaking with you. Thank you. It's been fun.